This will be our eighth installment in this series on the Lord's Table or the Lord's Supper or the Table of the Lord as it's called in Scripture. And the Lord's Table belongs to an order of things or a classification of things that are superior. Mm -hmm. Things that are better things, as the book of Hebrews says. The new covenant is a covenant of better things. And this table is associated with the new covenant. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's ironic that people that are noted for observing the Lord's table generally do not speak much about the covenant. In fact, they don't really say a lot about this table. And it's, a, it's a tragedy. I do know what I'm talking about because I was among such a people. When you're at this table, your mind should be, well, if you come to it properly, your mind will be flooded with the consideration of better things and superior matters. Things that are inferior will, will kind of fade into the background, which means you will be thinking like less of yourself. I don't mean belittle yourself. I mean you yourself will not be the subject that you're thinking about. And when you get into this environment of better things, it activates heaven. Mm -hmm. Things commence to come from heaven Amen. to you. It's like the, in, like the firmament of this, the spiritual firmament of heavenly realities is when your focus is on better things, the door to heaven opens wider. And when you're not focused on heavenly better things, it closes. Yeah. And you can't like turn this on with a s switch or some sort of a switch. The pre prefigurements or shadows or types of the Lord's Supper that are f were found under the law there, and there is no shadows or types or prefigurements of it outside of the law. The first covenant is the only only place you can find prefigurements of it. They were all introductory. Yeah. <clears throat> so they, they don't take you like deep. Mm -hmm. and, or they don't reach out wide. Now this is something that a person has to be careful in, in stating this. But when you deal with Moses and the prophets, you are not dealing with depth as God defines depth. Height and length and depth and width. This is it's introduced, but it's not explored back there. Now you may you may take them and then associate them with profound statements made by Christ and the apostles and but by of, of themselves, they do not deal with the depth of redemption. In fact, they don't categorically deal with the redemption of mankind. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a figure, a figure of it. So we're going to make some, some brief comparisons between these to show you that there's a limit to anything that was revealed prior to Christ. Yeah. This doesn't demean it. Mm -hmm. But it means if you want, it's, it, if you want to it, gain the depth of Christ and the depth of redemption, you've, you've got to extend beyond what was revealed, and particularly tonight with the Passover. Now that this is associated with the Passover, it is not associated with the Passover by doctrine. <coughs> 
No apostle drew a parallel between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. They did draw a parallel between the Passover lamb. Right on that. <laughs> that is parallel. But that's an interesting parallel because I believe some of us have talked about this. There are some people that have an extensive development of associations of the Passover with the Lord's table. But I'd like, I don't know how you really go about developing this since there's nowhere in the Bible. It's seen by type, and I'll show you some of the types, but they, they kind of break down. They're not, they just introduce you to the idea uh -huh. of remembering something God did. Now, under the ancient Passover, it was observed by families. It wasn't a group activity, like all the congregation that didn't gather together and observe the Passover. They observed it by families. The original institution of it specified this. Exodus 12, 3 through 4. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the ninth day of the month of this month shall you take to them every one a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. If the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to unto the house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So it wasn't, see, it, it was a kind of a smaller group situation. If you had a small family, you had your husband and wife and one child or two children, that wasn't enough to eat this lamb. And under the Passover, the lamb had to be consumed, all of it. And so you had to go to your neighbor and maybe he, maybe there's just two or three, four people in that house, so to, together you'd do it. And that was, that was about the, as large as a group as, a, as you could get. It was a couple of families. So it was done by family. And originally it was observed before the deliverance, not after the deliverance. They didn't observe it after the deliverance, but the original Passover was observed before the experience that, that was to be remembered by, which is an interesting thing to observe. Exodus 12, 11 says, Thou shalt eat... It with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. In other words, you're going to be leaving right after this. Right after this. So that's a, and there's a, there's a brief parallel in Christ, but it's not, it's not really like that in Christ. You celebrate before, they celebrated before the deliverance. And then afterward, of course, it was observed as they begin to make their journeys, they observed it again, this time in more, more remembrance of what happened. Deuteronomy 16 outlines it. Observe the month of Abeb and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God, for in the month of Abeb the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. By night. Actually, this was the beginning of the Jewish year, so the Passover marked marked the beginning of their year. Uh -huh. It was observed on the night they were delivered, before they were delivered, by night, and it, that was when they, they redefined, it redefined a year, what a year was. It started on that month for the Jews. All the rest of the world, they had some other calendar. They still do. There's a Jewish calendar, and then there's, a, there's the calendars that we go by. But they had us, that was when their year began. Their year began the night God did something. You, know, you should be able to develop it. You should be able to kind of pick up on, what, <laughs> on the glory of that. And uh, the Passover lamb was roasted with fire. Now, this, is, this is spelled out. It had to be done. And they had to eat bitter herbs with it. So they'd remember the hard bondage that they had in Egypt. Exodus 12, 8 puts it this way. They shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs shall you eat it. Say, well, I don't like bitter herbs. So with bitter herbs shall you eat it. Amen. If you want to come out, uh -huh. eat the herbs. Yeah. See, God never asks people, what do you want? What do you like? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he tells you. Yeah, yeah. And you learn to like what he said. You develop a 
taste, so to speak, for what the Lord spells out versus trying to have God adapt himself to your tastes. You know that that's quite common, do you not, in our day? And you, when you ate it, this was at night, midnight. You had to get dressed before you ate. Get everything on, ready to move. Get your staff in your hand. Gird up your loins so you can start moving about fast and rapidly. Eat it quickly. This is not a time to be moping around and you're eating the meal. This is the Lord's Passover. Amen. All we're waiting for is for the death sentence to be carried out. That's all we're waiting for. And be ready to get out of here at midnight. eating in anticipation of deliverance. The lamb, <clears throat> the lamb was offered by the people. They're the ones that offered the lamb. They're the ones that killed the lamb, eating it with haste, even though it was the Lord's, Lord's Passover. And it was kept at a particular time First month, 14th day, all the way back in the book of Ezra, he spells it out again. This was, this was the time appointed for the Passover, a specific time. It wasn't something you just generally remembered, every, and you did it once a year. Once a year, the high priest atoned for people's sins. Once a year, they remember their deliverance. That's really about all Israel can handle. They didn't do too well with the Sabbath days or these days, as a matter of fact. They didn't do too, too well observing whether it was a weekly or an annual. They didn't, historically, they didn't do too well in handling any of them. Now, by best, just a brief introduction to the Passover. And the scriptures don't really give you a lot of details about the Passover. It's interesting that people can present whole programs about the Passover. Yeah. You've got to get the source of their information someplace other than the scriptures. How can you do it? Yeah. It's just not a lot. You don't read about everything on the table, just the Passover, unleavened bread, bitter herbs. No mention about a cup. Interesting, isn't it? Uh -huh. All those things are reserved for a higher, more lofty. That's right. So if people want to go over something, they ought to go over the Lord's Supper. Yes, amen. It may sound like going over the Passover really going to put some depth to this thing, but I'm telling you there's not enough information there to give a lot of depth to it. Now the Lord's table, indistinct from the Passover, it's, it's a together ordinance. We don't do this by family. We do this as a body, as the body of Christ. Now the first, first Corinthians 11 chapter deals extensively with the Lord's table and it, it's a bunch of togethers in there. They all had to do with people being together. Now I've heard people argue about whether we ought to be together and is it important to be together. And say, These are non- Bible reading people. <laughs> That's what they are. And so I like to just say, you know, this is a subject of which probably you shouldn't do any talking. I'll do the talking on this subject, thank you. Because it's obvious you don't know very much. Because there's a considerable in the scripture about together. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You've probably heard live long enough to hear somebody say, serving God's my business, I don't I don't need to be with other mm -hmm. other believers. I can worship God myself. Well, I'm sorry we question that. Yes. That's going to take more than a testimony from you mm -hmm. to confirm that to our understanding. This is a together ordinance. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. Now this I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together, not for the better but for the worse. So he's talking. He brings up the Lord's Supper after these verses. He's talking about them being together, the body of Christ. Verse 18, first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there will be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. At least they didn't have two separate gatherings. They all came together. <laughs> so how come you bring that up about so much about the different gatherings? Because it's wrong. That's why. It's wrong for a body of believers to divide for whatever reason. It's just not right. You would say, well, we like, some people like to come early, some people like to come eight. Well, make all the people want to come at the right time. Together. 
Pick a time and let's get together. Amen. It's a together. When you come together in one place at one time as the church, you're together. 1 Corinthians 11, 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That, that wasn't saying you. this is why you should. This is saying you're not doing this to eat the Lord's Supper. There's still a lot of people that don't come together to eat the Lord's Supper. And he told him, he says, this is, I'm, I'm faulting you for this. I'm faulting you for this. This voids the validity of your assembly. Now, if you take this to its extended conclusion, you know, it, it can lead to some rather alarming uh, conclusions. Some people, when they come together, they'd be actually, they'd be better off if they didn't come together. Because they're not doing it for the right purpose. And some people, of course, don't come together at all for whatever purpose it is. 1 Corinthians 11, 33, here it is again, brethren. When you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. That ye may not come together to condemnation. The rest I'll set in order when I come. I mean, there's a lot of things there. I can't deal with everything by letter, Paul is saying. And then right after that, he brings up the Lord's Supper. They, they did it with a accompanying meal, apparently. And some people still do this today. They say, well, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper when they had a meal, so that must be how you do it. And that's what the Corinthians thought the same thing. So they had a meal. It's kind of like a potluck meal, except everybody ate their own lunch. And uh, some people brought a, they were well off, so they, they brought steak and potatoes and a real nice rounded meal, and they set it over, and their family sat over there at that table there, and someone else was poor. All they could bring was a crust of bread and a glass of water, and so that's what all they had. And so while they were eating in preparation for the Lord's table, some were filled with good things, and some were starving. And Paul brought it up. Amen. Paul brought it up. Yeah. He says, God's going to condemn you for doing this. This has revealed you don't really love God's people. This has, reve this has revealed you're really selfish. Well, people don't do this today because they don't have this meal, but today, as you know, they move the table to the back of the room, mm -hmm. and whenever you feel like it, you get up, you stroll back there and interrupt what's going on, if anything's going on, mm -hmm. and you go back there and you take the Lord's Supper and you remember Jesus and I imagine in some assemblies that'd be a tremendous transition to to take your mind off of what's being said and concentrate on Jesus. I, I'm not sure a lot of people could, are capable of doing that, to leave that uh, what they've been hearing. What I'm showing you is that this is a together ordinance. It's something the body of Christ does together. You really shouldn't compliment yourself by thinking Jesus will visit you privately and ignore everybody around you. I mean, I'm not sure that this is a good good way to think. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus came to meet his disciples. There were some key people he he gave a special appearance to. To Mary Magdalene and to Peter and to James. He gave a special, mm -hmm. special appearance to them after he rose from the dead. But then the key, whether we have a record of what was said, he, he appeared to all of them when they were together, mm -hmm. including those people that I mentioned. So there's something about together that attracts Jesus. In fact, he says, where two or more are gathered together yeah. in my name, there am I. He didn't say where one is, there I am. We don't doubt that that can be true, like he was with John in the Isle of Patmos. We understand there's no limitations with God. But when we talk about this ordinance, mm -hmm. it's more potent when the people are together. Amen. Amen. Now, the parallel of the Passover wasn't that way. You could observe the Passover in your tent and you got out of Egypt just as much as the person in the next tent. So it, was, it wasn't that kind of ordinance. You came out together, but you didn't eat together. But here you, you eat together, but you don't come out together. Yeah. <laughs> you see the, see the difference? See the parallel? Mm -hmm. The salvation is personal. Mm -hmm. Remembrance is collective. Yeah. Under the law, remembrance was personal and, and deliverance was collective. It was a different kind of thing, completely. Now, originally, the first, Lord, the first Lord's Supper was observed before the deliverance, when Jesus was with his disciples. 
But that was to institute it. Yeah. And from then on, it was with the disciples. So the lamb, and this the lamb on the Passover, the people chose the lamb, right? Each household chose their own lamb. And the specifications for the lamb were given. But in, in the Lord's Supper, God chose the lamb. Amen. We don't choose the lamb. Amen. He's God. He's the lamb of God. God brings his lamb to the table. We don't bring ours. He's our savior. He's God's lamb. He's our Lord. He's God's Christ. He's our deliverer. He's God's son. See, he bears a particular relationship to God. And this lamb <laughs> was delivered up by God. The owner on the Passover, the owner of the lamb brought the lamb to be slain. Mm -hmm. But in the redemption, God is the one that, that delivered the lamb. The lamb came from God. He delivered. He was delivered up yeah. mm -hmm. for us all, Romans 8.32. And again, under the Passover, the lamb was offered by the people. But in this, the Lord's table, the lamb offered himself. How's that for a distinction? He offered up himself, Hebrews 9, 14 says, without spot to God. So the offering is made by Christ himself. And it places the emphasis not on the deliverance, but on the means of deliverance. That's the difference in the Passover. The Passover remembered you came out. The Lord's table remembers how you came out. There's a difference, vast uh -huh. difference between the two. Now, on this table, there are no bitter herbs. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, we don't have bitter herbs here. We've got unleavened bread. We've got some in here. We don't have bitter herbs. That's replaced with a cup. Yeah. Cup of blessing, you might say. So at this table, it's not associated with what we were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's associated with what we are. Amen. See, under the Lord's, under the Passover, they remembered the hard bondage they experienced. That's what those bitter herbs is about. Make you wince to eat these herbs, but then that, that puts you in recollection of that hard, hard bondage that made you call out to God. Remember, they called out to God under that harsh bondage. That's not what you remember here. Yeah, you may be, you may be tempted to do this. At the Lord's table, you may be led to think about, well, what I was and I was and I was. Oh, you got to get off that and think of what I am, what I am, what I am. It's a different kind of ordinance. Not accenting what you come out from, but what you come out to. That's the difference. And it, uh, you have to be prepared when you come to this table. In that sense, it's, it's quite similar to the Passover. You have to be prepared. Examine yourself to see if you be. Uh -huh. Examine yourself and then eat and drink of it. Eat and drink at this table. Examine, Not to examine to see what you find in you. Examine yourself to see if you're looking the right direction. Uh -huh. Examine yourself to see if you're considering the right thing. Examine yourself to see if you're focused on Christ or on a dinner that afternoon or something else. The examination is unique. Yeah. You're, looking, you're looking to see, am I approaching this table in a suitable frame of mind? That's why we have helps, we have songs, we have music. That's why we do this, to kind of assist us to get our mind pointed in the right direction. Because, see, our lamb is been slain but he's alive mm -hmm. he's he, he was dead now he's alive forevermore and we're looking actually toward the live the lamb of god toward that yeah. toward that area and in this we're proclaiming his death we're not how can i say this we're not honoring his death technically we're declaring it there's a slight difference there we're not recalling his death, although you do have to do that to declare it. We're declaring it. Mm -hmm. We're acknowledging it. Some, there's something in particular to this that lets people know we believe and accept and glory in the fact that Christ died for us. Amen. We revel in that. Amen. And 
we, we, we do this until he come. So we've got the future in mind. They didn't observe the Passover till they got to Canaan. They had to observe it after they got to Canaan too. We observe till he come, till he come. And it's to be eaten with deliberateness. You have to make up your mind, well, I'm gonna only eat at this table. You cannot eat at the table of the Lord and the table of devils. You, you can't do it and there's somebody here in the room tonight that is advocating, it's an unseen person, that is advocating another table. And it's a phenomenal how he can plant arrows in your mind that kind of stick deep into you to ponder other things at this time. So we eat with deliberation and we eat it with a holy effort to avoid judgment. As you know, in Corinth, there were some people who got sick and some people who died because they conducted themselves improperly at this table. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep or are dead. He goes on to say that if we should judge ourselves, we should not be chastened. So we judge ourselves to see that our motives are proper here. God is, God is infinitely more sensitive about Jesus than he is about you. Amen. Now just a little bit of God's love toward you will compensate for a lot of things. But he will never shift his attention from Jesus to you. Amen. In fact, the only way he'll see you is if you're in Christ. Amen. Amen. That's the only way. Now, that's a message that a self-centered generation needs to hear because a lot of people think of God as interested primarily in them and loving them so much. And he, he does, but he loves Jesus more than he loves you. He's his well-beloved. See, this is anchored in Scripture. This is just not private opinion. He's his well-beloved son. So that's the Lord's table. Now let's focus on the differences here. The emphasis on the Lord's table is now. It's now. Let's go through the scripture just briefly here. Romans 6, 22 says, But now, being made free from sin, ye become servants to God. Romans 7, 6, But now, we are delivered from the law. Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus you were sometimes the far off or made nigh. Ephesians 5.8. You were sometimes darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. 1 Peter 2.10. In time past you were not the people, but now you are the people of God. See, in Christ Jesus, now trumps then, back then. Mm -hmm. What you are now is not to be compared, or what you were then is not to be compared with what you are now. So this table is associated with what, what God's made us, not what we were under the devil's the regime. And that's a distinct difference to make. The differences are, are in kind or order. It's a kind of deliverance. It's a, it's a different kind of deliverance than and Israel experienced. In Israel, it was a temporal deliverance to go to a temporal land. That's what it was. It was a, a temporal deliverance. This deliverance from Egypt didn't deliver them from having to die. Mm -hmm. And it was in order they might enter into a temporal land. So it was temporal. In the church, the deliverance is from unseen captors. Yes, See, we were vassals of Satan who was the prince of the power of the air that works the children of disobedience. We were, that's what we were freed from. We were freed from principalities and powers of darkness that dominate us. That's what we were freed from, from, from an unseen foe. In fact, you can't explain this to someone that's not in Christ, really. You try and explain to someone who's not in Christ how you've been freed from sin and freed from guilt and, and have a purified conscience and free from the devil and free from the law and free from the principalities and powers, that, free from the powers of darkness. They have no idea what you're talking about. 
But we do, so tell us about it, because we, we know what you're talking about. Israel's deliverance was from earthly oppression. Exodus 18, 8. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord delivered them. All external. Every bit of it. But as I have mentioned, our deliverance in Christ is from the powers of darkness. He had delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. See, that's what's associated with this table. It's a different kind of deliverance. For instance, we thank God that our brothers and sisters that lost their homes have obtained new homes. And it's in order to give thanks for it. But this isn't what we remember at this table. Because that didn't happen to all of us. That happened to a select few of us who God had picked out who were able to handle this. But at this table, this is something we all experience. He is a bit different. We all have experienced the deliverance that's remembered at this table. The Passover, it was a ritual. That's what it was. Here's how the scriptures state it. Numbers 9, 2. Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed time in the 14th day of this month at even. Ye shall keep it in his appointed season according to the all the rites. This is ceremony. Rites of ceremonies. Yeah. According to all the rites of it and according to all the ceremonies thereof. See, the, the Passover was a ceremony. Right. <laughs> you, went through, you could go through it mechanically. I understand that God and the people didn't, but that's what it was. It was a ceremony. But the Lord's table, it's not a ceremony. It's not a ritual. This, this is a cup that blesses. See, it's a cup of blessing. Jesus meets with us here at this, yeah, this table. It's a communion. See? So it's, it's not just a ritual at all. Even though we acknowledge that it has been treated as a ritual, and some of us have been guilty of treating it as a ritual ourselves, but it was because we didn't understand. Uh-huh. Now we do, so we don't do it that way. Amen. Now Israel, take for instance Israel. They remembered the deliverance. That's what they remembered. The book of Deuteronomy highlights this, Deuteronomy 16.2. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock of the herd, and in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there, thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. In seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction, for thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt. Mm-hmm. See where all the stress is? Yeah. Coming out. Uh-huh. That's not what the stress is in Christ. Uh-huh. In redemption, coming out is not the stress. Mm-hmm. It's coming in. Yeah. Amen. That's the stress. See, It's not what you left that's the point of focus. It's where you've come. That is the focus. It's, it's not what you are, what you were, mm-hmm. that is your consideration. It's what you are in Christ Jesus. That's Amen. what this table is. It's a different kind of table. Mm-hmm. See, the Israelites, they didn't remember what they were morally or spiritually. They remembered where they were. Yeah. We remember not where we were, but what we were. And now at this table, we remember what we are, which like is, a, is like a sun that rises and blots out this lesser glory of where, what we were. As the more you focus upon Christ, the less hold your past has upon you. Right. It's like Satan uses your past to get his clutches on you. And he's quite successful. He can... He can accomplish this in a moment of time. He can bring you down rapidly. 
But at this table, if you will exercise yourself to remember Christ, the Holy Spirit will enter into this because there's communion. This is the communion, remember. It's a, it's a fellowship. There's two sides to this. And as you enter in, doing the best you can, he fortifies your memory and he fortifies your recollection and he fortifies your resolve and, and it, Satan has got to let loose. <laughs> He's got to let loose. He can't maintain his hold because it's, this is superior. The recollection of Jesus is superior. The mind can't recall Jesus and what you were at the same time. So the Holy Spirit strengthens your mind to focus on Christ, and it can't, it can't, while you're focused on Christ, he can't. I can tell you that man that was let down through the roof, Brother Ricky told us about this morning, reminded us, where Jesus said, Son, be a good cheer, thy sins are forgiven you. I can tell you he didn't start thinking about what his sins were. Let's see what I can remember what I was forgiven of. Let's see. That's not how it works. Thanksgiving trumps all these recollections. When you repent, when you repent and you genuinely, genuinely renounce your past, your past loses its grip. And that's the way he's able to cleanse you from all, all sin. Now, the Israel remembered his deliverance. But the church remembers the deliverer. <laughs> this is good stuff, let me tell you. The church remembers a deliverer, not the deliverance. Now, I'm a great advocate of testimonies. I believe in giving testimonies and witnesses. But at some point, the testimony has got to give way to confession. That I'd like to confess that Jesus Christ is the one that's got the kind of spotlight, it's got to shift uh -huh. from what it took to get me out to who it took to get me in. Yes. That's the value of this, Amen. this table. This do in remembrance of me. Uh -huh. Twice he said it when he broke the bread and when he had when he took the cup, both times that this do in remembrance of me. Not a, he didn't say this do in remembrance of your deliverance, this do in remembrance of your chains, this do in remembrance of the grace you receive, this do in remembrance in remembrance of me. If you can like if you can put both arms around the deliverer, you've got all the deliverance. Amen. That's, right. that's how that's how it works. Oh, it's glorious, isn't it? Now Israelite Israel. The sacrifice is what they offered. That's what Deuteronomy 16, 2 says, Thou shalt therefore sacrifice, thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord. You, you do it. But Christ offered himself to God. See, that's why boasting's been excluded. See, yeah. see when it comes to boasting or glorying or a a more vulgar word would be bragging. Mm -hmm. You're shut up to bragging or boasting in Christ. Amen. Yet salvation is not wrought to provoke you to boast in anything but the deliverer and the one who wrought the deliverer. Yeah. So some people are proud of what they were delivered from. Yeah. Now we've got to be gentle with people like this because they, they probably have never heard, but you want to be proud of the deliverer, yes. not the deliverance. Yes. That's the difference in this Lord's table. There are things that the Lord's Supper, about the Lord's Supper, that were not prefigured. You probably detected that as I mentioned some of these things. See, the, the shadow is partial. The type is partial. It's not complete. So there are things that happened, that happens at this table that they couldn't be prefigured. The washing and making thoroughly clean, that wasn't prefigured under the law. Whatever washing they had was just ceremonial. Mm -hmm. It didn't really cleanse the conscience. It didn't purify anybody. It's a purifying of the flesh. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. But that's not what happens here. So making the transition from the Passover to the Lord's table is moving from an emphasis on the seen to an emphasis on the unseen. It's moving from the emphasis on 
what happened to you to who did it. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, the, the, that's the difference. The emphasis is not what you were. The emphasis is what you are. So this table is, is superior mm -hmm. in every way. You, you are not what you were. Mm -hmm. Amen. But if you keep the faith, you'll remain what you are. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> in fact, you'll improve. Mm -hmm. Things will go, things will go upward. You'll grow and you'll advance. And this is something that's not possible in an external environment. You, you cannot occupy the environment of the scene and steadily go upward. Everything in the scene environment is steadily going downward. So this shift had to be made. God knew that if men were going to get to heaven, so to speak, they had to get out of the external domain. In their thinking, they had to get out of the external domain. But for a period of time, this was something that God couldn't like just burst on. It was too big. See, it was, it was too profound to burst this on people. So he selected a people here for himself, and they took the brunt of what it takes to root the tree. Went through all the hardship it takes to root the tree, so that when he said these things to us, they... We could, we could get hold of them Amen. and see them. Thank God for this uh, better thing. Brother Robert has our exhortation.